Data Analysis Part 9. Uh, what is image data and how can this type of data uh, be uh, dealt with uh, in a particular case? Uh, so we'll look at some MATLAB methods. Hello everyone, welcome to Part 9 of this Data Analysis course. Uh, um, we're going to look at a particular kind of uh, data which is very important uh, for lots of uh, lots of modern applications and uh, very widespread in particular in uh, straightforwardly developing uh, tasks uh, which are often which you will be doing some of um, we're going to be looking at image data um, so the first part of this video will be on uh, some background just to uh, just just for me to give some context and say that uh, image data is not really a 20th and 20th first century phenomenon only. Uh, it's really, we're looking at uh, simply uh, modern methods for dealing with uh, for dealing with the same kind of observations which we would find in data analysis in general. Uh, so I want to give some context, and then we'll look at some details of uh, what uh, digital image data is and how you can manipulate it. And then uh, later on in the last part, so uh, next week, we'll uh, look at how some of the methods from uh, Bayesian data analysis of image data in general uh, can be usefully applied to um, the sort of particular technical things that will be done with image data. So that's what we're going to do. Right, so image data, or images just meaning a likeness or a, a painting used to record something, have been around in science or at least in technology, uh, this is more technology, I guess, for a long time. Uh, this is the oldest piece of uh, recorded image data. Well, it's the current record for the oldest piece of uh, image data recorded by some people. Uh, and it's a, a cave painting uh, from Indonesia of uh, an animal. So it's the, the animal uh, with the aid of... Um, with the aid of some people drawing the outline of it, uh, is a pig which has been drawn on the wall of a cave. So, uh, doubtless this has, d doubtless this is a just a nice piece of decoration, um, but uh, it's it's suggested that it's also um, it's a good luck, a good luck image. Uh, perhaps the idea is, is that pigs uh, would uh, come to the cave uh to uh, to admire uh, the picture uh, which they couldn't find anywhere else in the world and while they were admiring in the pi the picture uh, the people living around the cave uh could um, could could capture and eat the pig anyway whatever um so we know then of how somebody's come along and taken a uh, a digital photograph of this uh, oldest uh, human image so there's a uh there's there's a, there's a surreal element uh, in what we're looking at here but uh, the point is, image data is an old uh, is an old thing which we've had around for a, a long time, um, and it's something that we've got a lot better at dealing with. So, um, improving on uh, paintings where you have one uh, kind of uh, pigment which will stick to the cave wall that you can work with, uh, we've got a lot better over the years. Here's another piece of uh, an image which. Uh, supposedly records a scene. Uh, this is a painting uh, from the 1700s uh, of a very important scene in history. This is uh, the death of Socrates. Now, the death of Socrates, uh, around 400 BC or something like that, is one is an important uh, motivating, is, is a true event, and it's an important motivating factor in the development of uh, Western thought and philosophy, uh, particularly by his student Plato and subsequent people following on from Plato, which is well, everyone in the Western tradition. And because it's important, uh, this uh, guy in the 1700s thought to, uh, to uh, create, a, uh, create a painting to uh, visualise the scene. So one of the problems with paintings that are captured, uh, which are produced by people, uh, rather than captured by technology, which we'll see shortly, uh, is that they can get some things, some contextual things, fundamentally wrong, much as you get nice results. Uh, what's wrong about this painting? So Plato, who's pictured on the left, sitting, uh, looking unhappily um, at the foot of the bed, uh, while uh, Socrates has been uh, 
condemned to death for uh, for, <laughs> for corrupting the youth of Athens, or more realistically, for uh, annoying uh, people in political power. Um, uh, Plato is pictured as an old guy. Actually, no. Plato would have been something between 24 and 28 years old, I think, when this happened, and I think that's known quite accurately. So the, the painting is not showing you material fact, it's showing you an emotional truth that uh, Plato, uh, much later on, is reflecting upon this influential scene in his past. Uh, there are other things that are just completely wrong about this. Uh, Socrates was famously ugly in reality, uh, not so much in the painting, where he's, he's portrayed as, uh, classically, um, as a classical figure. And uh, what else is there? So in the background... Um, yeah, I say what you I, I, I don't think the uh, the stone architecture is particularly realistic, but no, more importantly, in the background, uh, there's this guy who's a um, yeah, young man leaning against the inside of the archway. Uh, he's very upset by the proceedings. So this this guy's name is Apollodorus. Uh, actually, if you read um, if you read uh, the what is it? Is it uh, Phaedo? I think. Um, as the Platonic dialogue, that's the, the particular one that gets to the actual death of Socrates. Um, you will uh, you, you will learn from this uh, written record that actually Apollodorus was sent home uh, before Socrates was uh, was was given his uh, was was um, was put to death with his poison uh, because Apollodorus was too upset and he was dragging down the tone of the proceedings uh, by not being uh, not not being sufficiently stoic, although the Stoics were later. So anyway. Um, Therefore, there there are big limitations on uh, what you can do uh, simply by getting uh, people to uh, represent uh, what they have uh, what what they have taken away from some situation in the physical world. It's much better if you can get um, a camera or an image sensor uh, to record actual physical data about what we're seeing, and uh, this is something that we've actually been able to do for a long time as well. Here is uh, the earliest surviving, not painting, but the earliest surviving uh, image captured by uh, an optical camera, although not, not quite an optical camera in the modern sense. So this photograph is entitled A View from the Window at Le Gras, and it was made in France in 1827. So um, at the time... Optics, so lenses, uh, were perfectly well able to give you an image on a screen uh, of the light they collected from some scene. Um, but uh, the new thing which was done here uh, was that the guy who collected it, let me just look up his name, uh, uh, French inventor, ooh, difficult to pronounce, uh, look it up on Wikipedia, View from the Window at Le Gras by French inventor Nicephore Nieps, or something like that. Um, he came up with a photosensitive film so that he could, uh, using a piece of machinery, uh, permanently capture uh, the image that was cast by his uh, optical system, which was uh, a straightforward system. Um, so he had a, a sort of photosensitive film, which was um, a, kind of, a kind of bitumen or tar. Uh, the idea was that when it was exposed to light, um, it would... Uh, it would whiten, um, and that's what you've got here. So you can just about make out that this is a physical scene of some buildings with some countryside in the background. Uh, you have um, some walls of the buildings are white uh, because the camera has collected light and lightened the bitumen. Um, some walls are dark, and you can see you've still got dark um, sort of um, very early film uh, there, and you've got some uh, brightly lit roof, and some dark shadow, and then you've got some dark side of some tree, and some white sky and horizon. Um, you'd also, if you look at this and you look at it carefully, see the shadows don't look very uh, correct, because you might see that you seem to have walls facing in opposite directions, uh, illuminated by the sun at the same time. Uh, actually, that's because in order to capture this image onto this particular early film. Uh, this is an eight-hour exposure, so it's an all-day-long exposure. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, so you've got your son 
has actually illuminated during the exposure uh, the images the buildings from both sides and you've got that uh, recorded so unlike your earlier paintings this is actually a completely correct uh, recording uh, by technology but clearly you can we can already see some of the key features which we're going to have to talk about in image data um, spatial resolution which is poor partly because of the you can imagine there's some drift during the image acquisition in this case there's also clearly just decay of the recording medium uh, you can talk about uh, bit depth you, or in other words um, uh, how many levels uh, from black to fully white uh, can you distinguish in your image data so you've got uh, you can imagine yeah so discretization by space spatial resolution uh, brightness resolution uh, discretization or quantization by brightness and of course here you've just got um, black and white or a small amount of grayscale uh, data to consider uh, you can see how all of those things are going to then uh, become more precisely defined when we look at actual image data um, and you could do another thing you could look at instead of uh, you could look at instead of uh, a static image you could look at an image stack so this is the idea of a, a succession of images being recorded is not new either this is not something for which you need a, a 20th century video camera actually that's just doing the same thing as a, as a series of time-lapse images and the, 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 the this this the, the, these these were first done in the 1900s uh, this is a <coughs> excuse me a uh, set of images captured and then turned into silhouettes uh, by a a guy whose story you should very much look up but maybe not in there maybe I won't tell it in a video lecture not here uh, an image stack uh, recorded by uh, an astonishingly interesting character uh, named Edward Moybridge leaving aside the time that he was acquitted for murder uh, Moybridge uh, was hired to do something which should inspire students today. He was uh, given uh, plenty of money and resources uh, by a rich backer. So this is identical to what scientists aspire to today uh, in most universities. Uh, his rich backer was Leyland Stanford of um, Stanford University, but a, a rich businessman. Uh, I think he was a railway magnate. But uh, anyway, very rich man, Leyland Stanford, uh, was uh, his, uh, later on in his life, uh, he was interested in sports and horse racing. And he um, commissioned uh, Edward Moybridge to settle a bet. And uh, the bet uh, was uh, over a, an, important, an important scientific controversy in the, the horse racing world, uh, which was to do with if you've got a horse which is galloping along and its feet are going uh, very quickly, uh, is there any particular point uh, when all four feet are off the ground at once? And uh, the, a lot of people suspected that the answer was yes. Um, and this was sort of important because people... Well, it's not important, but uh, it's important to wealthy people, which makes it important to scientists at the time and still today. Uh, because uh, it, it controlled, it, it, it defined how the, how uh, you should commission a, a painter uh, to paint your horse if you wanted your horse to be uh, galloping along in the painting. Um, would it be legitimate uh, to have uh, the horse with all four of its legs uh, spread out in front and behind, or should they be in some other configuration, or should there always be at least one foot on the ground? Uh, because your galloping horse moves uh, with its feet very quickly, uh, they weren't sure, so they commissioned a scientist to investigate. And uh, simply by taking a, a series of uh, time-lapse photographs, this time with proper film, uh, and actually not one camera that takes several exposures, but rather a set of 12 cameras uh, in a row, all triggered by, uh, not trip wires, all tri triggered by... Um, uh, whatever tape or something that the horse uh, was galloped through. Uh, you collected your 12 photographs, turned that into a time-lapse image stack, um, converted from uh, image stack to a, a silhouette uh, to show the um, 
So, so in, in other words, we, we could call these uh, images, you've got 12 images here, uh, these silhouettes logical images. It shows black where you've got horse and rider and white elsewhere, uh, obtained from the actual image data. Um, and you can then answer your question, which uh, the which Moybridge was commissioned to by the rich businessman. Uh, you can say, yeah, there are these uh, frames uh, two and three. That's what the horse looks. That's what the shape of the horse looks like when it's off the ground. And this was a revolutionary advance in uh, for wealthy people wanting to spend money on painting. And uh, uh, Moybridge became very famous for doing uh, this sort of stuff. And so uh, he did these images not only for horses, uh, but also for lots and lots of other kinds of animals um, at a zoo. I think it was Chicago Zoo. You'd have to check that in his Wikipedia article. Um, so that answers from your processed image data something that was... Uh, well, you were paid to do it, but also something that was kind of important from a, a bioscience perspective. Um, from our perspective in this uh, lecture, uh, you might find it... Uh, you, you might. Ooh, I'll have to um, see if I can get the slideshow working for this. Well, we might find it more useful to t take the actual uh, image set and turn it into a, a video so that you can watch this. But um, actually, that, that at the time was relatively hard, so there the, the were... Sure, there were there were strange mechanical methods for showing image stacks as some sort of projected video data, uh, which they worked on using the using these kinds of animation, not only for horses but also for this my, my favourite one, this weird animal, uh, 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 this American bison. I don't know if it's at all scientifically useful to know that the American bison doesn't gallop in the same way as a horse, uh, presumably because it's a bit heavier. Uh, but it's hilarious, uh, so that's great. Um, these kinds of image stacks, although they uh, predate modern image data, they, in principle, you know, they they show you some of the same things that we're going to think about. Uh, the idea that you uh, spatially resolve at different levels of brightness, so you have some uh, observation where you've got uh, spatially resolved positions, uh, brightness resolved. Uh, grayscale levels in this case from uh, fully black to fully white and you might also have these time resolved and in more modern applications you very probably also have them uh, color resolved so you might have uh, which which amounts to having the same thing uh, but for say three different color channels although there's other ways of doing um, color encoding as well uh, so we'll uh, look at them uh, briefly. Uh, one more thing to look at before that is that although I've been talking there about images as if they're all going to be uh, the, uh, brute force raster images where we've got uh, a series of values for each uh, picture element, uh, there's one other way you should know about being able to handle image data uh, which is as a, a vector image. This also isn't a new one. So a vector image uh, exists because what I've described so far for this picture of this bison, I've implicitly described a raster image. So the idea of turning this photograph into usable image data, well, I'm suggesting you divide the uh, you divide the uh, actual physical brightness image into uh, a few hundred rows and a few more hundred columns, and for each element of that, uh, you measure and record a uh, a brightness, a, uh, a grey level from 0 for black up to 1 for white, or some other encoding. We'll look at them in a table shortly. And this is fine, but it clearly generates large amounts of numbers or large amounts of data, which, uh, although on a much bigger scale, is still a challenge today for, say, satellite imaging. You get an awful lot of data. How do you, uh, how do you deal with that? How do you get down to just the bits that you need? Um, so you should know about vector images simply because uh, some useful modern formats for you recording your graphs are vector images. And what is a vector image? Well, it's it's actually more like, um, instead of uh, doing a brute force machine recording of every uh, brightness level within a, a rectangular array, uh, which is what's been done for a raster image, a vector image is basically a join-the-dots picture. And I mention these uh, in this sort of background section because uh, the idea that you can send useful data as a vector image also isn't a new 
computer science idea from the 20th century. It's uh, it's at least as old as a 19th century idea. Um, so the um, and and here's here's a patent, which, oh dear, um, it, it is a horrific, horrifically burdensome way of sending an image, but uh, proves the point that you can do it using a lot less data uh, than in your full brute force raster image. Uh, so the the patent here is uh, someone says, well, I I want a way of sending uh, pictures of people via not the internet but via the telegraph system in the late 19th century and the way they suggested doing this was that you uh, sell people a sheet of graph paper with the rows and the columns labeled and then they come up with some way to uh, say well what do I, I want to uh, reduce the the image to just line art and for each line I have uh, a way of encoding the start position of the line on my uh, graph paper and a series of uh, points that you connect that start point to and then a, a finish position for your line. So if you do that, uh, these people who wrote this patent argued, well, yeah, with uh, with uh, just a, a chunk of text which uh, fits in, say, one column of newspaper, you can send a photographic, well, you can send a rough likeness of some picture and then at the end you uh, fill in a bit more details like well, the, the hair is close cropped or whatever and uh, and what color it is and uh, with that information the idea is you've got the shape uh, encoded scientifically using uh, coordinates as join the dots and uh, you've got uh, some description of the texture that somebody uh, somebody with a bit of artistic skill should fill in. That's the same principle uh, used in vector graphics in modern formats uh, like uh, EPS or some PDFs or uh, some EMFs. Uh, uh, the idea is that instead of uh, sending your uh, brute force a rectangular array of pixel values to describe something which has scaling problems if you zoom into it uh, you send your description of your lines like you want a, a start point here and you want your line to have a, a, a semicircular end cap whatever so you um, encode that and that's how you should be uh, producing graphs ideally um, for your um, uh, well, well uh, for your future work um, because you'll find that it, it, scale, it zooms in much better and it and because of that it's much better handled by uh, printing systems and things. So vector graphics are uh, not a uh, recent idea, that's the point of that slide. Uh, digital image data though, um, actually dealing with it as a raster images, uh, is also uh, relatively old. Uh, we won't go through these next slides in detail, this is just to show uh, the idea of uh, scanning in a photograph one pixel at a time uh, that was really made possible about the 1920s um, with analog electronics and photodiodes this uh, by the way uh, you may know that Einstein came up with um, three really outstanding ideas uh, in 1905 uh, one of them on Brownian motion one of them on uh, special relativity although Poincaré and Lorentz had already done that better, uh, but whatever. And uh, one paper on uh, the photoelectric effect, which is scientifically the most trivial, uh, but he, the Nobel Prize Committee have always had their eye on what is going to be really important. And they gave Einstein the Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect. Um, that was partly a correct call on their part, that actually the ability um, to scan in images using photodiodes, for which Einstein gave a, a description of how that works scientifically, uh, that was going to really change the world uh, much more than uh, a knowledge of special relativity. And I'm sure that's right, because uh, for the rest of the 20th century you have uh, huge amounts of uh, image data and visual media, and um, there are very few cases where we've ever needed special relativity. Um, but you wouldn't have, um, without photodiodes and some knowledge of how they work, you wouldn't have movies, for example. Um, so digital image data, uh, converting photographs to uh, a rectangular arrays of grayscale brightness, that goes back to the 1920s. 
actually um, transmitting them over the well, actually telegraph network, but early telecom system uh, goes back to the 30s and it gets gradually better um, over time so that you have uh, by uh, by the late 30s you have an amazing compact system uh, which you can actually carry for digitizing and sending image data. Wow. And then by the 21st century we have uh, stuff that is a lot more modern in particular, a lot more ways of dealing with color, uh, including um, color channels which don't remotely correspond to visual color channels but correspond to different infrared color channels as for example in this um, uh, uh, space photograph which is of uh, all of the far infrared using the Herschel Space Telescope um, and astrophotography. So we have a lot better ways of capturing image data uh, but all the principles of how it should be processed um, are applicable to, to old um, measurements that have been around for a long time. Okay, that's enough on background. Uh, let's look at some uh, more useful technical definitions of what is image data and uh, how can we process it in some uh, straightforward ways. So what is image data? Okay, uh, definitions. I will give you two different textbook definitions from uh, decent-ish image processing textbooks. I think the world has as, as a bit of a shortage of really good uh, digital image processing textbooks that go into details, but the, the two I put up are okay. Um, and that's, I think, partly because the, the field evolves and all of the things people are really interested in, like um, uh, convolutional neural networks and fancy compression and analysis uh, methods, uh, these evolve quite rapidly. Um, so you don't necessarily have textbooks which are really good on the basics. Uh, but the, the two coming up uh, will give uh, acceptable definitions. Um, be careful if you're dealing with image data scientifically about the dictionary definition, uh, which won't quite work for you. A definition of an image, so originally means a reproduction or an imitation of the form of something. Especially it used to refer to a statue. Um, more recently uh, you'll see image uh, specifically uh, referred to as the an optical image or uh, a real optical image of an object produced by some sort of uh, some sort of a, a glass some sort of optical device and we're interested especially in that which has been collected and then turned into digital form we're also we're also interested in the fact that other kinds of data can be converted to the form of digital image data even if they're not actually collected as optical images so useful textbooks to uh, talk about. Um, I'm going to talk about the uh, the Gonzalez and Woods definition uh, textbook, and the uh, the Petru uh, uh, textbook on image processing the fundamentals. Um, these are not. I, I'm not going to put these up as particularly recommended reading. Um, it's just that both of them have introductory chapters which give uh, definitions of uh, what is uh, image data. Um, these are the references at the bottom of this slide. Uh, again, you don't need to read these. Um, if you want to look at uh, some nicely written, uh, brief, uh, modern examples of what you can do with processing image data scientifically, or in the case of uh, Dave Green's Cube Helix Color Map, which I uh, recommend using sometimes, um, how to optimally visualize data, especially for um, uh, human inspection either in uh, color image data on screen or, or for uh, almost equally optimal printed grayscale color. Uh, you can look at that manipulation. Uh, those are just um, nice papers that I quite like uh, which deal with image data. Um, they're not sources of definitions, uh, it's the references at the top um, for definitions of image data. Uh, but you don't, need to, um, you don't need to read these textbooks or look them up. Uh, they're not especially amazing, they're okay. Um, in terms of treating uh, digital image data mathematically. Uh, but I will simply put up their definitions uh, just to show that they're consistent. So here are the common features of what people say uh, as a definition of images. Uh, so Petru, that's the, um, the older textbook, says an image, and there you see they're being much more precise than the uh, dictionary definition. They say an image, a monochrome image, is a two-dimensional light intensity function. 
f of x and y, where x and y are spatial coordinates, and the value of f is proportional to the brightness at that point. Uh, they then go on to say a digital image. You see their definition of an image there was a mathematical object, uh, not a physical object, although they say the mathematical object refers to a light intensity function. Um, but it's actually f of x and y, which has values, so it could actually apply more broadly than that. Um, they say a digital image is an image, following their, their definition above, uh, which has been discretized, both in spatial coordinates and brightness. Uh, they say the digitized brightness is the gray level value, and each element of the array, uh, each spatial element, is called a pixel. That's uh, Petru's definition of uh, digital image data. Um, that's perfectly good. It's basically consistent uh, with this next definition. So we can we can take them as uh, as we can take this as the definition of digital image data uh, for want of uh, any um, uh, any perfect standard in the world. Uh, Gonzalez and Wood's more recent textbook. They say an image. Uh, they're saying something a, more, a bit more general. Uh, they say an image uh, may be defined as a two-dimensional function f of x and y, where x and y are spatial coordinates, uh, same thing there, and the amplitude of f at any pair of coordinates x, y is called the intensity or gray level of the image at that point. And uh, that's basically the same, they just uh, don't uh, say that it has to be a light intensity function. Um, it could be collected from some other means. Uh, it could be a, an ultrasound uh, data source, for example. Um, a digital image, uh, Gonzalez and Wood says, is uh, when their image has x, y, and the intensity value of f, all finite discrete quantities, then we call that uh, a digital image. So those are basically consistent definitions. Um, so you need to have the concept of uh, your image data being uh, f of x and y, and we're looking at x, y, and f, and the value of f, all discrete quantities in image data of the type we're thinking about uh, here. How is image data obtained? By loads of different ways. Well, you have um, actual methods which do optical imaging and do give you light intensity distributions, like Petru says, um, photography, uh, ordinary optical microscopy. Uh, you could do uh, shadows or projections, so medical x-rays are really shadows. Uh, they're not imaging in the sense of image formation with a lens, uh, but you still collect um, well, sort of light intensity functions, but they're collected as a shadow uh, cast by whatever object you're x-raying um, by passing a column of x-rays through it. Uh, you could have scanning methods as well, uh, where you're uh, image data is collected one point at a time, or one line at a time in document scanning, or in sonar, or confocal microscopy, uh, where um, in X and Y one particular uh, pixel of your uh, object is scanned to see, for example, how brightly fluorescent it is, and then you move to the next point, and then your time series of uh, brightness values are turned into an XY image, uh, either um, computationally or physically. Um, also, uh, sometimes you just do a, a mathematical a function, and you would just want uh, like uh, you want to image some sort of uh, uh, you want to image some sort of distribution, uh, like a, a Gaussian distribution in two dimensions. You might just convert that to image data rather than show it as a a mesh, uh, an x y z graph. So you can have things which are not uh, optical image sources giving you uh, digital image data is the takeaway from that. Um, nonetheless, uh, common features of what image processing involves, um, some sort of physics of the image acquisition, which might be optics, might be sonar, might be whatever. Uh, some details about discretization uh, in spatial, usually X and Y. Um, but people talk about three-dimensional image data where you measure, say, fluorescence intensity in x, y, and z as a, uh, a z stack. 
people talk about that. So discretization spatially, usually in X and Y, in the simple cases we'll look at in this course, just in X and Y. Uh, discretization in intensity or gray level. Uh, possibly discretization in a number of different color channels, usually red, green, and blue, and maybe in time, so that you get time-lapse image data or uh, full motion video, which is a fairly vague term. Um, usually there's then analysis, so we've got image data, how can we use it? And then usually we might have a, a result step how do we visualize what we learned? Well, sometimes we visualize what we learned. We might just write down a number, like there are seven cats in this picture, or we might do a, a more elaborate visualization. So you take an image data and you apply some uh, modern process which makes all of the cats uh, purple or something, so they stand out against the background. Uh, so those are the four steps uh, involved in image processing generally. Image acquisition, some sort of discretization of the data, some sort of analysis of the digital image data, and then some sort of visualization of the results. So let's look first at image acquisition. Actually, uh, there's, a, there's a huge amount of good descriptions of um, acquisition of optical image data uh, in textbooks on the internet. I will give you a link to uh, one very good one shortly, uh, from which I've, I've extracted these slides. Uh, but I'm just going to show you here that the steps I said of um, physics of image uh, image acquisition and discretization and storage as digital image data. Uh, these are what you will find uh, in these descriptions of how uh, image acquisition is done. Um, so this is from uh, I'll find this I'll find this on the internet. Okay, this is from a much longer uh, course on image processing uh, by this guy Alan Peters uh, in the USA. Um, so I've uh, extracted, which you're really, so it says you're allowed to do this for non-commercial use. I borrowed some slides from him, uh, which I think uh, show the, the overall what we're doing. Uh, you can look up a lot more if you need to on um, some methods in more detail. Uh, I'm just giving an overview at this stage because I, I imagine you have uh, some sort of familiarity uh, with what we're doing. And anyway, we just need uh, for this course to look at image data processing in a sort of introductory way, uh, enough for me to make the point that we can then go and apply some of the, um, the the interesting data analysis Bayesian methods from earlier in this course to the results that we can get from uh, uh, doing uh, modern, uh, useful uh, processes to extract uh, conclusions from image data. Um, so uh, from this lecture course uh, by this guy, Alan Peters, so the idea is we're interested in some object in the physical world, uh, like this uh, orangey red sort of uh, Lego model pine tree or whatever. Uh, the point is, what if there is some sort of physical mechanism, uh, it's a lens here, some optics, uh, with which uh, we capture a physical image of the object. In this case, it is a light intensity distribution, a function of X and Y. And it's actually in color uh, in this case. Um, so you have your, your physical light intensity distribution, which is in, in theory, mathematically, that's a continuous function. Um, but we have put this onto a, <coughs> excuse me, an image sensor with rectangular elements. So we're going to have um, discrete, uh, discrete uh, values observed for each XY position in the physical image. That's what's actually going to be recorded by the sensor. And um, in fact, that's because each uh, photosite of the image sensor, uh, a photosite is the physical location that corresponds to a pixel or an XY position uh, for your uh, image data. Uh, each photosite uh, just gives you one value for either the grayscale brightness, or in this case, it's giving one value for the, um, the it, 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 it's actually handling indexed color from uh, nothing which is white uh, up to seemingly red which is uh, maxim uh, maximum maximum value uh, so if I was doing this I would maybe maybe have showed this as a uh, a grayscale but this is uh, with uh, in this case colors corresponding to discrete uh, values that it's sampling so as I said you've got physical object um, physical object you've got a continuous image function of X and Y 
uh, but you have an image sensor which which samples this in a way which is uh, discrete x y positions and for each x y position it can only capture a number which is the average brightness from the uh, received as a result of the, the image the uh, the optics capturing the scene in reality so you end up with a discrete real valued image um, that's one way that you can capture image data uh, you will need to know that there's a few ways uh, that image data can be recorded uh, because uh, one of the uh, early things that you might need to do in image processing is potentially uh, to manipulate between these or to avoid uh, confusion as to what happens uh, because of the fact that there's a few different uh, modes or format formats in which um, image data can actually be stored uh, within uh, a computer or within a computer uh, system like MATLAB. Okay, so let's look at this slide on reading uh, image data, so types of image data. Okay, so types of image data, and when I'm talking about types of image data here, I'm not talking about um, the file format. Uh, you'll have come across the fact that there are JPEGs and there are PNGs and there are GIFs, uh, and there are a lot of other things, EXIFs, whatever. Um, we're talking about when a computer program like MATLAB has opened up a file, the actual data of the image itself uh, might be stored in a few different ways. And uh, depending on whether you, uh, when you open this image data and in MATLAB, when you uh, deal with it, it matters a lot whether you're looking at um, val grayscale values which are described as um, numbers from 0 to 1, uh, where uh, 0 corresponds to grayscale black or no brightness and 1 corresponds to white or maximum brightness. Uh, that's one way that image data can be stored. Another way is that you might find that uh, the same principle applies but it's as integers from 0 to 255 instead of uh, floating point numbers between 0 and 1, fra uh, fractional uh, numbers. So uh, image type so simplest kind of image type, uh, you've got the top row of this table, uh, just um, a grayscale raster image uh, of the of the bison from earlier. Now I would call this a intensity image or a grayscale image, and uh, this is uh, the simplest kind of image data for you to worry about. Uh, there's a few different ways it can be stored. Uh, you might find uh, that you have so first of all, it's going to be an M by N array, so a rectangular array of pixel values. But you might find that the value of each pixel uh, is an 8-bit integer, uh, which it will be in many uh, m many uh, common compressions because this is a nice nice compact way of storing data. Uh, only 8 bits per pixel, and in in which case you might find that you have uh, for each a pixel, a number from 0 to 255, where 0 corresponds to uh, black or minimum brightness and 255 corresponds to white or maximum brightness. Uh, so for example, zooming in on a bit of the bison, so a bit of the ear, uh, you see the black bits uh, you can see correspond to low numbers in the actual data as, 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 as dealt with by MATLAB, and your white bits of the ear correspond to high numbers around um, and when I say low I mean under 100 and when I say high I mean around 200 in this case. Um, you might find uh, in some cases uh, that your image data is instead stored as a double precision floating point number. So particularly um, if you're if you're not dealing with uh, cheap, uh, nice, uh, conveniently compressed for inexpensive handling uh, commercial camera data. Um, cheapo data that you've copy pasted off of Twitter is likely to end up as 8-bit, well it'll be 8-bit colour not 8-bit grayscale, uh, but it's likely to end up in the 0 to 255 notation. Uh, if you have a scientific camera it's quite likely that you'll be collecting image data 
that has more than just uh, eight bit depth. Uh, we say bit depth. Um, if you've got zero to 255, then that's eight bit uh, depth of your gray levels. Uh, you might have 16 bit image data, or very commonly you'll find your camera might detect 12 bit grayscale depth, or sometimes 14 bit grayscale depth. Uh, but then for uh, computer science reasons, it decides to store that uh, using the uh, the first 12 or 14 bits of 16-bit numbers um, for ease of handling. Uh, when you do that, you might occasionally find 16-bit image data, which is um, 0 to zero to about 64,000-ish. But uh, it's more likely that you'll find that your... Uh, your um, uh, number representing the brightness has been uh, scaled to a digital floating point number between 0 and 1. Uh, for example, by saying that uh, zero, 0 on your 16-bit data maps to 0, and 64,000, if that's the maximum of the scale, uh, maps to 1. Uh, in both cases, your visualization uh, is intended to be by linear scaling of the value to a, a grayscale brightness, um, or actually to a physical uh, radiance uh, given off by a screen. But uh, there are hazards because uh, you will find that some functions are intended to visualize um, image data, which is on a scale 0 to 1, and other functions are intended to uh, visualize data on a scale 0 to 255. So as a result, sometimes you can find that your uh, beautiful, uh, very high very high bit depth image data, which has been stored as values from 0 to 1, ends up visualized, and it's completely black, as visualized by a function that's intending to, it's expecting to receive image data from 0 to 255. Um, the details of how you fix that uh, are, well, you need to um, have a look in the help file for the function, or um, more to the point, just be aware that that's an issue of uh, how um, image visualization uh, works, or how MATLAB functions like ImageSC uh, work. Uh, some of them, uh, ImageSC is pretty good, uh, handle things pretty intelligently. Um, some of them will naturally scale the output uh, will naturally scale the numbers so that the minimum number in your actual image data, the minimum value in your image data, uh, even if that's, say, 30 out of 255, uh, might be visualized on the screen as fully black. Um, in other words, it might uh, implicitly do a contrast stretch. Um, so if your data only goes from 30 to 60, um, your uh, a, a clever image visualization function, and I think MATLAB's ImageSC probably is one of these, uh, might scale uh, your uh, data to fully fill up the uh, black to white brightness range of the screen. Um, other functions will not, and usually and you may sometimes want to be able to force them to do one thing correctly or another. Um, so that's just some comments on, well, what if you have the simplest kind of image data, uh, grayscale brightness? Um, Another version of grayscale brightness, uh, which could take the same kind of input uh, but be visualized in a different way, uh, is indexed color. So in indexed color, uh, I've applied, I've taken the grayscale bison picture and I've, I've applied uh, the, the cube helix color map. So in MATLAB, you're looking up um, if I've got some uh, image data which I know is grayscale. Uh, you might find uh, that if you uh, if, if you uh, get MATLAB to do um, image SC, it might automatically not present it as grayscale black to white. It might present it as this um, as, as some other color, uh, probably not as nice a color map as this one. Uh, it used to do jet, which was a horrible color map, and it now does a, a blue to yellow indexed color map by default for lots of things. Um, which is a bit better. Um, at least it prints a lot better. Um, what you've got here is the same numerical values, but each value um, is given a, a red, green, blue color using a color map uh, with which it's visualized on the screen. 
Um, the advantage of this is that you get slightly more human perceptible intensity levels because you're not just varying the uh, intensity of the light, you're also varying the, uh, the hue, uh, the color. Uh, this means that instead of perceiving, say, 10 different levels between black and white, you might be able to manage to perceive, say, 14. Uh, so you can see a bit more detail. Sometimes uh, you can also use this um, in clever ways to uh, to compress uh, color image data. Okay, um, but that's uh, not particularly important. It's just that you should be aware that sometimes, uh, if you're expecting a a mono some, something that was originally monochrome, uh, just black to white uh, image data recording, sometimes your MATLAB or other programs will visualize it automatically in indexed color. Uh, if you want to stop them doing that, you can usually apply a command such as color map gray uh, to make them visualize it in the boring gray scale that you might think is scientifically nicer. On the other hand, you can take boring scientific data and apply a color map. And people do this all the time in electron microscopy uh, to, make their, uh, to make their images look more vibrant. Um, and whether or not they should you know, is uh, a matter of aesthetic judgment. Um, so index color is like grayscale color, but there's a color map for visualization, and you can tell the computer what color map to use. Some image formats will store their color map with them. Uh, this allows them to, uh, in some cases, take red, green, blue color images and store them just using, uh, for example, 255 or 256 different colors. Uh, which might be intelligently chosen. So that's a way of doing uh, compression. Um, intelligently chosen to uh, reasonably well fill the range which is in the actual image data. In general, uh, you will be wanting to deal with a color image data of this type, so a red, green, blue image, or true color image. In that case, uh, in MATLAB, your image data might look like this. Uh, you might have, if you're dealing with the simple 8-bit case, you might have a an M by N array for your rectangular pix picture uh, times three layers. And for each of those elements, you end up with a number in the range 0 to 255, uh, where your, for example, your red, green, blue image, uh, asking MATLAB to show you all rows, all columns in layer one, gives you the brightness in a red channel for this. Uh, and similarly, uh, image red, green, blue, colon colon 2 gives you all rows, all um, uh, columns in the second layer, so the green channel, and you see that applying this to a small chunk of this picture of a plant, uh, you've got a red leaf and then a green leaf behind it, so you see you have a high green brightness for the bottom of that little bit of image data and a low green brightness on the red leaf, uh, whereas your red colour channel was pretty much the same value everywhere. Uh, you have nice contrast available uh, by exploiting the fact that there's a difference in the green brightness. Uh, you can do, of course, the same uh, to look at the blue channel. Um, so uh, you will be, be wanting to do uh, this kind of manipulation if you want to inspect your image data. Um, MATLAB is one way of doing it. Large numbers of um, Large numbers of bits of software are available for doing image manipulation. If you like uh, free software, you can get ImageJ. Um, I, I recommend Irfan View if you just want to uh, open up image data and inspect it. Uh, ImageJ is freely available scientific image processing software for microscopy. Um, there's another program called IC, uh, which is a joke on IC, uh, but it's ICY, IC. Um, if you want to be able to scientifically delve into the sort of the, the numerical pixel values and have a method of applying uh, image analysis and reconstruction methods, um, I see is one method for that. Uh, I'm recommending here, and I'm showing you there, um, some scripts from MATLAB. Uh, for those of you doing the course uh, on Moodle, the some sample MATLAB scripts are available uh, for dealing with. Um, and we'll look into the next time uh, some specific methods that we might apply. Um, for now, uh, let's just say, let's, let's finish by saying there are different kinds of ways. Now that we've got this data, it's been collected by some optical or other image acquisition method. Uh, we've looked at how it can be stored um, 
at a basic but good enough level. Uh, let's just say there's a few different ways that we can process it. We'll just talk about low, mid and high level image processing methods. Um, what are these? So you've got we've we've got image digital image data. We know all about that. Um, a low level transform. Um, inputs and outputs are still image data. Um, and I would say in general we're doing things that are not drastic. So for example, if I've got some image data on the left, uh, this is a, a uh, the digital image data from some fluorescence microscopy of a bacteria spore with a fluorescent coat. Uh, if all I do is I take uh, those pixel values which I've visualized on the left uh, as the raw data and I double all of them, uh, then I might get the uh, representation on the right. But I've taken raw image data and my output is image data. Uh, that's a, a low level transform. Uh, in general, I'd expect this to be reversible, uh, unless I go on and do awkward things like um, double the numbers and end up outside the range uh, for the uh, the image mode, so outside of 0 to 255. Um, then I might end up with a saturated image where I can't reverse the process. But your low-level inputs, uh, so your input and output, their image data, all I've done is something like <coughs> double the brightness. <coughs> <coughs> double the brightness. Uh, in other words, apply a contrast stretch. Uh, mid-level image data, a uh, mid-level process. So the outputs uh, here uh, include um, attributes which are deduced. So this is a descriptive statistic of the image data. So I would say um, taking your uh, digital image and saying that the result which I want is not a another image, but now I want the image histogram or imhist if you're in MATLAB. Uh, in other words, how many pixels have each brightness value? Um, then I apply imhist and my result, my data from my output is, um, it's deductively true, it's 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 a descriptive statistic, it, it's certainly correct. Um, so this makes it a mid-level transform, uh, but it's no longer in the form of image data. It's in uh, the form of a list or um, uh, probably uh, an array of what is the pixel value in column one and how many pixels have that value or brightness level in column two. And I could represent that. I could then visualize that as a histogram, uh, but I couldn't go back from how many pixels are completely black uh, to say what the image was. So your mid-level uh, transform is generally irreversible. Uh, and then your high-level image processing, uh, this includes um, statistical inferences. So uh, transforming, the, uh, processing the image data in a way where we um, we add more information to it and we reach conclusions which may not be completely certain. Uh, but we can do quite fancy things with this. Um, so you can uh, look up a paper of mine if you want a, a fancy example of this. So given a diffraction limited image of a bacteria spore, I can apply some mathematical transforms. I'll put the link uh, to uh, another video on this in the uh, in the caption of this video. I can apply some mathematical transforms uh, from which I take another piece of information which is I know this bacteria spore is spherical and I can learn from the raw image data which is diffraction blurred. I can learn some parameters, the, s the radius of the sphere, and then I can do an image reconstruction. I can say what would the image have looked like uh, if I did not have the problems of diffraction limitation. So uh, this is very much not reversible uh, because, um, well, it's not, it's, um, or rather it's, it's, it's going beyond. I'm, I'm getting a result which takes more information than just what's um, in the raw image data of the bacteria spore. I'm applying some assumptions about the structure and I'm uh, reaching a, uh, a conclusion which is true provided the assumption that the sphere is that the object is spherical is true uh, but it would be uh, it would give you a very strange result uh, if you if you gave it image data of something that was not uh, a spherical object okay so high level outputs uh, these include um uh, as i said mid level uh, you're doing uh, deductive 
transforms where there's complete certainty of how you get a result from your image data. High level transforms, uh, you are doing statistical inferences where uh, you're combining the image data with some other information. And you can get very good results when you uh, when your other information, your assumptions about that are true, and you combine them in a, a good way. Okay, uh, so those are um, a classification of different levels of severity of what people do. Uh, we will look next time at some key operations in image processing. Um, so just taking your image file, reading it in with MATLAB's imread, uh, doing segmentation, uh, that means finding objects of possible interest, uh, doing some analysis, so taking those objects of possible interest and learning some property about them, and we'll look at some visualization methods. So we'll look at that um, on Monday. Okay, and uh, then we'll uh, look at how you would go about um, describing uh, in a report uh, a good way of describing uh, what you've done with your image processing. Uh, what I will say about that is that when you do image processing, it's important um, to describe um, how the information is processed. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll get to this next time, but it, it's important to describe how the information is processed. You can often do this uh, visually as a flowchart uh, showing your image, to image at various stage of processing. It's generally, unless you have some context where you need to do it, uh, it's generally not a good idea uh, to refer to the the particular software in, in implementation. Like I used a particular function to do this uh, contrast stretch. No, you just say you, you did a contrast stretch, or you, uh, in other words, you, uh, or, or you just say you visualized it, and you just show the. the we'll 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 get to that next time. So, uh, some details about the best way to uh, write up. Um, uh, write up image processing. Um, good. But uh, what we have covered in this talk is uh, these, uh, in this video, is uh, these steps of, we talk about, well, that there is some physics of image acquisition. The fact that we're dealing with discretized data uh, and the, the various types of image data as handled by MATLAB. And we've talked about uh, different ways uh, that you can learn about an object. So after that, we'll go on to uh, look at particular examples you will find useful, hopefully, of uh, methods to process that. And once you've got some conclusions from processing some simple image data, uh, we'll, uh, or some, in other words, once we've done some image analysis and we've learned some properties uh, of some objects uh, by analysis, uh, we'll look at some good ways to interpret that using the actual Bayesian methods from the first part of this course. Uh, so that's what we will do. Good.